Our story now is about the quiet diplomatic triumph of the Indian NAC. India's engagement with the Taliban regime in Afghanistan is starting to bear fruit. In a further effort to engage with India, the Taliban regime is undertaking initiatives to return private land to Hindu and Sikh minorities in the country. You heard that right. The so-called Justice Ministry of the Taliban regime has started work on restoring property to the, to the displaced members of the Hindu and Sikh communities. Suhail Shaheen, the head of the political office of the Taliban, has said that they have set up a commission that will ensure the return of Hindu and Sikh families who have played a historic role in the economy of Afghanistan. According to reports, these properties are being reclaimed from warlords who are associated with the previous Western-backed regime. This is a major development. It shows that the Taliban are taking efforts to address the injustices experienced by the minorities who have long endured displacement as well as marginalization. You see, Hindus and Sikhs have long been integral parts of Afghanistan's demographic landscape. They historically constituted around 1% of its population. However, their mass exodus began in the late 1970s and the 1980s. It was due to political tumult and the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. And then the rise of the Taliban and the cycle of violence in the country resulted in further dis displacement of these communities. A large number of Sikhs and Hindus also left Afghanistan after the Taliban takeover overthrew the government of President Ashraf Ghani in 2021. And in the aftermath, Afghan Sikhs and Hindus were given the means to reside in New Delhi. It is important to note India has not recognized the Taliban government in Kabul as the de facto rulers, but ice has been broken by the two sides. India has tried to engage not indoors, but engage with the Taliban regime. In fact, last month, an Indian delegation met the Taliban foreign minister, Amir Khan Motaki, in New Delhi. New Delhi directly engaged with the leadership in Afghanistan. The two sides discussed various issues, including cooperation to combat the threat from the Islamic State Khorasan province. So you see, even though India has not recognized the Taliban officially, New Delhi has engaged with the regime as they are central to the future of Afghanistan. And therefore, Taliban's decision to restore land to displaced Hindus and Sikhs can only be seen as a positive sign. It shows that Afghanistan is rectifying the wrongs inflicted upon its minority communities. In fact, reports suggest that the Indian officials viewed this development as a positive gesture towards India. There are signs that the diaspora is now returning to Afghanistan. Take the example of the prominent Afghan Sikh population, Narendra Singh Khalsa. Nearly three years after he was evacuated by the Indian government in the aftermath of the Taliban takeover, Narendra Singh Khalsa has returned to Afghanistan. His return to Kabul was announced by a Taliban government department called the Contact Commission on Liaison with Afghan Personalities. In 2019, Khalsa was an elected leader in the lower house of Afghanistan's parliament. When the Taliban took over in 2021, he was one of the two Afghan Sikh parliamentarians to be evacuated to India. And according to reports, Taliban's new policy of restoring the private property of Hindus and Sikhs is part of a wider image building effort of the Taliban government. You see, Taliban wants to show the world that it is leading a responsible country. It is also an indication of the Taliban's positive attitude towards India. Like I mentioned earlier, India does not recognize the Taliban regime in line with the rest of the international community. However, it has stepped up its engagement with the Taliban, especially with Indian diplomats who have been stationed in the Indian embassy in Kabul since August 2022. You see, India's priorities in Afghanistan include providing humanitarian aid, ensuring the formation of an inclusive government, combating terrorism and drug trafficking, and preserving the rights of women, children, and minorities. Yes, the Taliban administration is nowhere close to fulfilling the promises that it made as foreign forces withdrew from Afghanistan. But perhaps continuous engagement with the Taliban regime could be 
one of the ways to address critical challenges in Afghanistan. And to that end, India has continued its relations with the Taliban. And this is why we call Taliban's latest policy move a triumph for Indian diplomacy. A famous museum in London, the Wallace Collection, has unveiled its highly anticipated exhibition. It features the line of Punjab, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the Sikh warrior king. The exhibition will run from April 10th to October 24th. It delves into the extraordinary life and legacy of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the visionary leader who founded the Sikh empire. On display is a splendid array of weaponry, intricate miniature paintings and exquisite jewellery from the Sikh empire. They have been sourced from both public and private collections. At the heart of the exhibition lies the story of Maharaja Ranjit Singh's reign. By the turn of the 19th century, when there was chaos and instability after Afghan invasions, Maharaja Ranjit Singh emerged as the undisputed king of Punjab. It was his rapid ascent to power that led to the birth of the influential Sikh empire. Paying homage to Maharaja Ranjit Singh's life, the exhibition is inspired by flourishing trade, vibrant arts and the development of a brave military force during his reign. You can see historic artifacts from Maharaja Ranjit Singh's court. Some of them belong to his family members such as Maharani Jind Kaur and Maharaja Duleep Singh. For the first time ever, the museum is displaying its group of Sikh arms and armour. One of the highlights is a magnificent sword. The sword is believed to have once belonged to Maharaja Ranjit Singh himself. It was adorned with gold and gemstones. Also on display are a stunning miniature painting of Maharaja Ranjit Singh and the golden throne crafted by her face, Muhammad Multani, for Maharaja Ranjit Singh. While he is celebrated for his military prowess, many don't know that he fostered political alliances that brought about an era of peace and prosperity, religious tolerance and multiculturalism. Despite tensions with the British East India Company, Maharaja Ranjit Singh maintained cordial relations with modernizing, while modernizing his army with European assistance. His enduring legacy earned him the label Shere Punjab, that is the Lion of Punjab, he was revered not only in India, but globally as well. His foreigner admirers refer to him as the Napoleon of the East, in fact. Shifting our focus now to the war in West Asia. Do you know about Israel's Iron Dome? Yes, the defense system that intercepts its enemy's missiles. But that's not the only one it has. Israel also has an Iron Dome to protect its sea. It's called the Sea Dome. The IDF, in fact, has used it for the first time ever. How does the system work? How efficient is it? Let's take a look. The Sea Dome is the naval version of the Iron Dome. It's a surface-to-air missile system, basically. It was first unveiled in the year 2014 and declared operational in November 2022. At the time, the Sea Dome was hailed as a significant milestone now it has been put to use for the first time ever. How does it work? Quite similar to the Iron Dome, it even uses some of the same technology. One major difference is this system is mounted on ships, on German-made warships. The Sea Dome is integrated into the ship's radar to detect incoming targets and that way it ensures complete vessel protection and high kill probability against a full spectrum of modern threats, both maritime as well as coastal. You see, Israel is ramping up its naval defense. The port city of Eilat, in particular, has been the target of aerial, aerial attacks by militias in the region, including the Houthis in Yemen. Just last week, a flying object that wasn't intercepted by the air defense struck a building in the city. An Iran-backed group in Iraq claimed responsibility for the attack. On Monday, an unmanned aerial vehicle entered Israeli airspace from the east and entered the Gulf of Eilat. That's when Israel decided to use its sea dome. Videos circulating on social media captured flashes of light as the defense system intercepted projectiles mid-air over the sea. 
The IDF released a statement saying, and I'm quoting, following the sirens that sounded in the area of Elith regarding the infiltration of a hostile aircraft, IDF naval forces identified a suspicious aerial target crossing into Israeli territory. The target was successfully intercepted by the Sea Dome Naval Defense System. And that's not all. Israel has used multiple other defense systems and warships for the first time since the beginning of its war with Hamas. It deployed the uh, SAR C-class corvette in combat for the first time last October and has continued to use it. Other defense systems include the missile interceptors Arrow 2 and Arrow 3. In fact, Israel has used them against attacks launched from the Gaza Strip and the Red Sea. You see, Israel is boosting its defense. It has been since the war started. Until now, it had been supported by its allies. But as the conflict drags on, Israel is losing support. It stands isolated on the global front. In the latest, Turkey has decided to impose trade restrictions. The country has been a staunch critic of Israel's military actions in Gaza. It first announced that it is limiting exports of 54 types of products to Israel with immediate effect. The products, by the way, include aluminium, steel, construction material, jet fuel, chemical fertilizers. And in a tit-for-tat move, Israel also announced that it is preparing a ban on products from Turkey. All of this comes after Israel barred Turkish military cargo planes from airdropping humanitarian aid to Gaza. And as Israel continues to lose support globally, ramping up its military and defense seems to be its only way forward.